I have all kinds of things that I brought up here today as we get together to talk about the resurrection. Some of you may, you may have uh, seen some of these things. You've seen one of these before, right? We'll talk about that in just a minute. You've seen these? A, a glass case for my reading glasses. And by the way, people say, I, I absolutely, you know, I love it, I love it, I love it when the pastor brings his Bible up and opens it. I just want you to know that everything on this sheet is in here. <laughs> so why is it on this sheet? So I can see it. Praise God for computers that can increase the font size. I want to tell you a story as we begin our time together. We will be looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But I was in a service, and they were sharing stories of the way that God had impacted and changed lives. And they told the story of a young gal who had received over a thousand stitches because she had been cutting herself. And she came to church, she'd wandered into the church and she'd heard the gospel message, which we'll talk about today, that we're sinners in need of a Savior and that Jesus can not only heal us, but he can forgive us and offer us new life. And so she responded and she gave her life to Jesus by his grace. But the weeks passed and the months passed and she couldn't or wouldn't stop cutting herself. In, in my years of ministry, we used to give out a little booklet on cutting. Do you know what cutting is? When people try to inflict physical pain upon themselves, oftentimes to get free from a lot of the mental anguish they're in. And so she came to the service and it admitted that she was having trouble getting free from this. And the pastors had a prayer for her. And she said she went home that night and she had a dream. And in her dream, Jesus came to her. And he reached out his hands and he said, pointing at his scars, My scars are sufficient. I don't need yours. I don't know what you think of that or what you do with that theologically. Frankly, I think God's bigger than our boxes. And I'm not going to put him in a box. All I know is that young gal then stopped cutting herself. She received other counsel. It wasn't. And I know something else that I told that story in Iowa at the church I was serving at. And after the service, a young gal walked into my office opened her purse and said, I don't need this anymore. And she dropped, it was a yellow razor blade, you know, the kind that you... And then she showed me where she'd been cutting herself. I think we ended up working with about 18 different folk. I don't know the number. You, you see... What we're talking about today, whether Jesus rose from the dead or not, matters. It matters to the young gal cutting herself. It matters to the person trying to get free from guilt. It matters to the person who's depressed. It matters if Jesus rose from the dead or not. Amen? So what we're talking about today, it matters. Can you say that? It matters. It's not just a game. Now, in our house, growing up, Easter was a day we celebrated the risen Lord. Amen? But I like chocolate, and I've got nothing against bunnies, so on Monday, we'd have bunny day. How do you like that? Some of you here already are ahead of me, and you know why we did that. 
50% discount day after Easter. <laughs> Mama didn't raise any dummies. The, the first point I want to bring across, and we're going to look at these passages then, is the gospel is not the gospel and gives no hope if Jesus has not risen from the dead. There's got to be something better you can do with your time if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead than sitting in a church. Are you with me? Now, you, you may ask yourself, okay, but that's fine, but what about this? Well, just wait. I'll talk about that in just a minute. <laughs> Go to the scripture. 1 Corinthians 15. Now, I would remind you, brothers, and, and here he means brothers and sisters, I believe. And I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. You realize when, when we have faith in Christ, we are saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. Amen? Sometimes Christians forget. In Philippians it says, He who began a good work will bring it to its day of completion and act as if they've already been completed. Anybody here already to completion? Is the, so the gospel is not something we merely preach to somebody else. It's something we preach to ourselves. In fact, we'd do well if we stopped listening to ourselves and started preaching the truth of the gospel to ourselves every day. Amen? Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. That would say to me, there's a kind of belief, an intellectual kind of consent that's not really a, a lasting belief. You would believe that, right? It's not about just passing a test on theology. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Some of you are here for Good Friday. What a powerful thing for me. And I hope for you to reflect upon the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, he suffered so much, not only because he loves us so much, but because our sin was so great. I remember saying in a, in a, in a jail Bible study one time, the reason the self-esteem movement won't work is because you know yourself too well. But I've got good news for you. When you kick away all the excuses that you try to use to justify your sinful behavior, grace can take its place. Amen? I knew I'd get fired up today because this is the gospel. <laughs> that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture, and that he appeared to, Cipha, to Cephas then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. I had somebody one time say, are you, are you preaching, pastor, that we're saved by works? I believe we're saved by grace. I said, I believe we're saved by grace that, that produces faith that changes the way we live. I'm not preaching a salvation by works. I'm preaching a grace that works. Amen? What have we done, people? That we, we, we live in a world that thinks it doesn't matter if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead or not. That's a kind of a feeble, weak version of Christianity that's not really Christian, right? If you're here today and you go, I've got some questions. I mean, I went to college, some questions were raised, and I don't know that I believe in the resurrection and those things. I'm glad you're here. 
Really glad you're here. Love to talk to you, okay? Don't, don't feel that we're pushing you out the door. But all we are saying to you is it matters to discuss those questions. Right? Everybody with me? Here's, here's what the gospel is. The gospel is that we were created by God with a purpose of bringing glory to Him by loving Him and loving one another. Do you believe that? And that's opposed to a culture that tells us that we evolved by accident. We're heading from nothing to nothing, but really love yourself. I mean, you're a bubble on an infinite sea of nothingness, but go get them. And second of all, we teach that we were meant to be connected with God and live in harmony with one another, but mankind turned their back on God, and that separated us and disconnected us from God and caused disharmony. But Jesus came, fully God and fully man, and died and rose again to reconnect us to God and place us in a community of harmony. Isn't that the gospel? To reconnect all by grace who would put their faith in Jesus Christ. Is that something to be excited about? Okay, I better move to point two. Don't forget, don't let me forget about this, okay? Because here it is. The Christian faith is vain and hopeless if Jesus has not risen from the dead. There's a lot of things I don't like to see empty. How about you? I don't like it when my gas gauge is empty. <laughs> Empty's not always good. But I'm really excited that the tomb was empty. But you know what vanity is? It's when you're grabbing for something and, and there's really nothing there. Years ago, I used this as an illustration. I got this last night from the restaurant I was at. I asked the waitress if, we, if I could have an empty carry... What do we call these things, anyway? Takeout take out box. And I had nothing to take out. <laughs> but, um, because I want to use it for a sermon illustration. Now, how many people here have a favorite restaurant? Go ahead, raise your hand. You just love that restaurant, right? And do you have a favorite meal? And do you ever buy just a little bit extra? And you're going to put it in one of these take-home boxes, and you're going to have it for lunch. And you put it in your refrigerator, and you are excited. You go to bed and you look in the refrigerator, and there it is. And you go, tomorrow I'm going to have me a nice lunch. Are people with me? Maybe I shouldn't do this so soon to, to uh, your noon meal. Maybe you skip breakfast. Then you wake up in the morning, and you're having your cold cereal, and you're excited, okay, about that, but you're not as excited as you are about this. You look in the refrigerator, and there it is. For lunch, am I going to have a great lunch? Well, that happened to me. I was at a Mexican restaurant. My, I love Mexican food. I had this great meal ready. I did just all of those things. And then lunchtime came, and I went in the refrigerator, and I pulled out the white take-home box. And guess what was in it? Nothing. Nothing. And you know why? Because I had teenage sons who beat me to it. <laughs> And I happened to be soon getting ready for an Easter service, and I said, that's what, that empty container in the fridge, that's what Christianity is like without a resurrected Lord. You with me? Hey, I don't, I don't want that. Ted Turner one time was on uh, a show, and they were interviewing him, and he said, and they asked him this question. Some of you know who Ted Turner is? He's got, he's got a little bit of money, I understand. And they asked, what is it like to be so powerful and so rich. And he said, it is like an empty bag. But nobody knows the bag is empty, so they keep reaching for it. Wow. I just want to jump in right in the conversation and, and take over the interview and do a little gospel sharing, but... 
The Christian faith is vain and hopeless if Jesus is not risen from the dead. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 12, and 13. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as risen from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Okay, point three. The Bible and apostles are hopeless liars if Jesus has not risen from the dead. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, you know what you can do with this Bible? Go start a fire with it, do something with it. It's useless. Please don't do that. I love my ESV study Bible, and it is true. 1 Corinthians 15, 15. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. When you get home later, you can read all of 1 Corinthians 15, if if you would. I think that'd be great. I'm going to take some verses out of it. Is that okay? We're not out of context. I'm not ripping the other ones out. I just want to point out some things. Now, I'm looking at time because a couple illustrations here I, I wanted to throw by you. What would you say if I told you I really don't have a wife? I really don't have a wife. I mean, you know, we have that nice little picture of me and the family, but Paige is really, she doesn't exist. I just made that up because I thought it would be good to get a job here. (laughs) Would that matter to you? I mean, I just thought you guys would like me more if I made up that story. I hope you'd go, I think we've got a question whether we should hire that guy. If I said, well, actually, you know, my wife died years ago and I don't really have a wife anymore, again, you would have some concern. You'd also have concern because you've met her, right? <laughs> but, but let me ask you one more thing. How would I go about showing you that I really do have a wife? Would I get to the file cabinet and find my old marriage license and certificate and say, see, I'm married? No, I'd probably say, here she is, and she's coming. I do have a wife. You never know. See, people sleep partially through sermons sometimes. And the stuff that they come away with sometimes, it's really scary when you've been preaching for years. Did you hear what Pastor said? He doesn't have a wife or his wife died. So if, you, if, if you've not been paying attention, that was an illustration, hypothetical circumstance. She's living and well. And so is our Savior. But the way to prove he's alive is to point to him, introduce people to him, right? Amen? And pray that God would give people eyes to see and ears to hear. Next point. Our sins are not and cannot be forgiven if Jesus has not risen from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 16 through 18. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins, then those who are fallen asleep in Christ have perished. I'm sure in the size group here, we can all talk about people that we believe are in heaven, in paradise with Jesus. But if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, that's not true. And our sins haven't been forgiven. You know, we, we sent a check out for earnest money on a, on a house, and the check didn't arrive. So we had to cancel payment and send another check. And then the mortgage company sent us a receipt and confirmation. You know the confirmation that our sins have been paid for in full and complete is a risen Savior. The reason I believe that so many people that I come in contact with are living empty lives is because they don't know that the tomb is empty. The reason I believe we contact so many people who are living empty lives is that they don't know the tomb is empty. The reason we run into so many Christians that live empty lives is they've forgotten that the tomb is empty. 
John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, lived in the 1700s, wrote an article called More Than a Calvinist. Now, at first, people got all turned off on the Calvinism thing. It really, it really didn't have much to, as much to do with that as it had to do with this. He said, it's good to defend doctrine. It's good to understand truth. But there is a danger in defending doctrine that you become arrogant. So this is what he suggested to do to keep that from happening. He said, whatever doctrinal error that you're going to confront in someone else's life, and whatever arguments you're going to use to come against that doctrinal error, first use them against yourself and why you don't live is that that doctrine was true. He said, for example, if your neighbor, and he wrote in a little different vocabulary, I'm modernizing his, his language, but he said, for example, if a, if a neighboring church started to preach that God isn't everywhere, you would call that false teaching and you'd be concerned, right? But before you go to them to talk to them about their false teaching, per, first ask yourself why you do not live as if God was everywhere. You say the greatest purpose of life, for example, is to live for the glory of God and that God is everywhere. So why do you flick off that inappropriate television show or inappropriation? Uh, I'm modernizing his language, of course, here. Website. When your wife walks in, acting as if God was never there in the first place. And so I say to you, there are our neighbors and people in churches who try to act as if it doesn't matter if Christ is risen from the dead. Before we go to them, and we should go to them and present the truth in love, amen, but first we should get on our knees and say, Jesus, how should I live knowing that you've risen from the dead? What areas of my life do not point to a risen Savior? In America, we've often domesticated this, this sin of grumbling and complaining. That's why people from other nations will often say to me, why do you Americans have so much and complain so much? Point five. Christians are to be pitied more than all people if Jesus has not risen from the dead. Some have got into the, uh, the Pascal's wager and said, you know, even if Jesus isn't really risen from the dead, we still have a great life as Christians. It's interesting because that's not what the Apostle Paul says, is it? He says, if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead, then we're pathetic. We're to be pitied. People go, such nice folks, but they really are messed up. But the good news is, he has risen. Yeah. Risen indeed, if, if a few of if you uh, were on board there. He has risen. risen yeah, think about those words, 1 Corinthians 15, 19 and 20. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Point six, the Christ has risen from the dead, and we have grave-busting hope. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is assurance of things hopeful, the convictions of things not seen. One of the problems is we can use biblical words but not mean what the Bible means. Because when we talk about hope, we said, I hope I win the lottery. But, but hope in Scripture is a firm confidence that better things are coming. Amen? You know, every day, God sends me reminders that this isn't the final destination and that I need a life after this one. Right? We do everything to try to make this, it all about this life. And we look around as we see our, our hair become gray and our eyes get dimmed and we can't do some of the things we could do before. It, it, it's an indication this isn't final destination. Right? If you question whether Jesus really rose from the dead, don't you owe it to yourself to spend some time reflecting upon it and seeing why we believe in the resurrection of Christ? 
Romans 15, 4 says it this way, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scripture we might have How fragile is our hope when we put it in the wrong things? There was an episode of Jerry Seinfeld in which he's sitting with his friends at his little diner. He's just come back from a funeral. And he says this, Funerals make you think you've got to stop wasting time. But then you think, what could I be doing that would not be wasting time? That's the culture we're in. And why are we in that culture? We have empty lives because people don't know the tomb is empty. Right? And by the way, whether you believe in the resurrection or not doesn't mean whether it happened or not. It happened whether you want to believe it or not. Gilbert... K. Chesterton wrote, The old humility was a spur that prevented a man from stopping, not a nail in his boot that prevented him from going on. For the old humility made a man doubtful about his efforts, which might make him work harder. But the new humility makes a man doubtful about his aims, which will make him stop working altogether. Do you see see what he's saying? Without an empty tomb, what are you living for? What purpose is there for your life? What are you aimed at? I love the line from Oswald Chambers where he said, often we think that God is missing the mark because we're too short-sighted to see what he's aiming at. Chesterton wrote in his book, Heretics, this. He said, we are fond of talking about liberty. That, as we talk of it, is a dodge to avoid discussing what is good. We are fond of talking about progress. That is a dodge to avoid discussing what is good. We are fond of talking about education. That is a dodge to avoid discussing what is good. The modern man says, let's not decide what is good, but, let's be, let, it, but let it be considered good that we not decide. He says, away with your old moral formula. I am for progress. This logically stated means... Let's not settle what is good, but let's settle whether we are getting more of it. He says, neither in religion nor morality, my friend, lies the hopes of the race, but in education. This clearly expressed means we can't decide what is good, but let's give it to our children. Did you catch that? And what does that have to do with the resurrection? (laughs) Is your life aimed at something? What's good? Is it good to believe that Jesus rose from the dead? See, some people say, well, I can't say if it's good or bad. Some people do, some people don't. That's what Chesterton's attacking. Chesterton's attacking this attitude. Eh, it doesn't really matter. Is it bad not to believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Yeah, it's bad not to believe that. It messes up your life. Oh, now you're being a religious bigot, Pastor. Call me what you want. I don't think it's about me. I think it's about the word. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your your victory. O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Your life won't all be about an empty container in a refrigerator with no food in it. We have something worth grabbing onto. What is my prayer? My prayer is that through faith in Christ and by the grace of God, we unite together as a church. 
with other churches around the country and around the world and proclaim that Jesus has risen from the dead and therefore our lives are not lived in vain. We give hope to people consumed by guilt by saying Jesus has risen from the dead and there is a payment for your sins that is complete and full in Christ. And then I pray that we will follow the words of Jim Elliot. You guys know who Jim Elliot was, some of you? The missionary who was martyred for his faith? Elizabeth Elliot, writing of his life, said that uh, Jim Elliot had written this. Lord, make my way prosperous. Not that I achieve high station, but that my life may be an exhibit to the value of knowing God. May our lives, may our lives be windows through which the world sees the power of a risen Savior.